Preparations are underway for the complex job of removing nuclear fuel rods from the number four reactor at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. A hydrogen explosion severely damaged the building following last year's massive earthquake and tsunami. More than 1,500 fuel rods must be removed from the spent fuel pool before the building can be demolished. The plant's operator will use a special crane to remove the fuel. Workers will also construct a cover to prevent radioactive materials from leaking from the building. The structure will cover the upper part of the pool. The utility will also install a filter to prevent the spread of radioactive materials. The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi plant expects to complete the cover by autumn of next year. It will then remove the spent nuclear fuel from the pool and store it on the plant's premises. The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has sent a robot inside one of the damaged reactors. The inspection was aimed at pinpointing areas where water is leaking. The utility needs to repair the leaks before it can remove fuel rods and decommission the plant. Tokyo Electric Power Company plans to fill the containment vessels of the reactors with water before retrieving the melted fuel rods. But highly radioactive wastewater continues to leak out of the containment vessels of the number one to number three reactors. So TEPCO first has to repair the damage to the containment vessels and suppression chambers underneath. TEPCO on Wednesday sent a robot with five cameras and a dosimeter into a scaffold around the number two reactor's suppression chamber. Workers maneuvered the robot to check about 90% of the upper part of the 125-meter donut-shaped chamber, but they found no serious damage or deformation. The utility says there were no leaks or water leaks or traces in manholes on the chamber where leakage had been suspected. But TEPCO has not been able to confirm the conditions of pipes connecting the suppression pool and the containment vessel, where the company also suspects water is leaking. Researchers say they have detected high levels of radioactive cesium in earthworms around the damaged Fukushima Daiichi plant. The researchers are from the Forestry and Forest Products Research Institute. They checked cesium levels in earthworms at three locations. They checked one sample from Kawauchi village, 30 kilometers from the plant. They detected about 19,000 becquerels of cesium in every kilogram of worms. They took a second sample in Otama village, 70 kilometers from the plant. Those contained 1,000 becquerels per kilogram. They took a third sample in Tadami town, 130 kilometers from the plant. The levels there were about 290 becquerels. The researchers say cesium levels rise in proportion to the radioactive levels in topsoil. The worms feed on decomposed leaves in the soil. I'm concerned that earthworms with high levels of cesium will have an impact on forest animals. He says researchers will need to monitor the radioactive impact on these creatures to prevent contamination throughout the food chain. Japan's Atomic Energy Commission has proposed three ways to dispose of the spent nuclear fuel from the country's nuclear plants. The commission has been reviewing Japan's nuclear energy policy since last year's accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. A working group revealed the three options on Wednesday. The first proposal calls for a continuation of an ongoing recycling project that involves reprocessing plutonium from spent nuclear fuel into uranium-plutonium mixed oxide fuel. The fuel could then be used in a fast breeder nuclear reactor once the reactor enters practical use. The second proposal calls for abandoning all fast breeder reactor research and fuel recycling and burying the spent fuel deeply underground. The third calls for storing the fuel for the time being and deciding within 20 years whether to use it in fast breeder reactors or bury it. The Commission plans to select one of the measures by the middle of this year. 
Workers at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant are trying something new to prevent the spread of radioactive materials. Tokyo Electric Power Company will start cementing the seabed near the plant during the day. Extremely high levels of radioactive cesium have been detected in the area. Nuclear fuel rods in three of the plant's reactors melted down. Contaminated water then leaked into the sea. Ships are expected to retrieve the fuel rods and other debris from the plant within a few years. Many worry the vessels will stir up the contaminated sand. Workers plan to start pouring cement and clay over a 70,000 square meter area near the water intakes of all six of the plant's reactors. The seabed is about six meters deep. Spokespersons say a layer of cement on the seabed will prevent the spread of contaminated mud and sand for about 50 years. Workers will begin full-scale application of the cement later in the month. They hope to complete the task by summer. This documentary shows what life has been like for people in Fukushima ever since the nuclear emergency. The film Ordinary Life is the work of a cameraman from Sapporo in northern Japan. NHK World's Toru Shimokoshi has more. About 400 people turned out for the premiere in late March. I'm afraid that people will discriminate against me because I lived in Fukushima. I'm also worried that I'll have to live differently than other people. Cameraman Taizo Yoshida interviewed 50 people for his 80 minutes documentary. They describe how they cope with radiation. We might be able to return home in 10 years. We won't be alive then. We'll be dead in a few years. Yoshida arrived in Fukushima a month after the disaster. While working as a volunteer, he shot the film. People in Fukushima have to go about their daily routine while protecting themselves from radiation. That is their ordinary life now. I think it's hard to put all these feelings into words, but if you approach them sincerely, they'll give you good answers. The invisible threat of radiation has affected the people's lives. This woman is measuring radiation levels outside her home. Yoshida followed mothers who are trying to protect their children. The most shocking thing of all was something my young son asked. Mom, how long will we live? He's just a child, much too young to worry about things like that. Mirei Suzuki is one of the mothers who appears in the film. Her son, a college student, lives outside Fukushima. Even though there's less than a 1% chance, radiation could still affect my son. So I keep saying to him, for your mother's sake, don't come back to Fukushima. The last time I saw him was New Year's Day, 2011. Suzuki attended the premiere. Speaking as a mother, she asked the audience to stay interested in the people affected by the nuclear incident. We adults have to think about the future of the generations that follow us. It's our responsibility. I hope that people will continue to hold on to their memories of the ordeal in Fukushima. 
People who live far from Fukushima don't understand what it's like to deal with radiation every day. Eventually, they will spend less and less time thinking about it. Through this film, you can listen to the residents and think about them. Yoshida is preparing the English translation of this movie. He's hoping to screen the film in Canada and the U.S. this summer. And he'll keep filming in Fukushima in preparation for a sequel. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government is warning that 9,700 people could die if a major earthquake were to hit directly under the capital city. The death toll would be 50 percent more than earlier estimates. The government's first estimate in six years is based on a worst-case scenario of a magnitude 7.3 quake occurring in the northern part of Tokyo Bay. They also say the quake could be closer to the surface than previously assumed. It says about one-third of Tokyo's 23 wards could experience tremors up to an intensity of 7, which is the maximum on the Japanese scale. It also predicts 70 percent of the area could experience tremors of 6 plus. The government's estimate says such a quake could collapse or heavily damage nearly 400,000 buildings. It adds that if the quake hits at around 6 p.m. on a windy winter day, fires could destroy about 200,000 buildings. I can't imagine what might happen. When I think of last year's disaster in Tohoku, we could be next. So we have to prepare properly. Millions of people would be stranded in such a disaster. Collapsed buildings and fires would keep nearly 5.2 million people from being able to return home. Of these, 1.6 million would have to seek shelter outdoors. The government also estimated tsunami damage to Tokyo resulting from a magnitude 8 quake occurring at an underwater trough south of Tokyo. It says a tsunami up to 2.6 meters high could surge into Tokyo Bay but would be blocked by seawalls and floodgates. But the government says if all the floodgates were damaged by the quake and could not be shut, 16 wards would be partially flooded up to about one meter. That would destroy or heavily damage up to 2,500 buildings. Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant can be viewed as being a step closer to a st state of a cold shutdown. Tokyo Electric Power Company announced on Thursday that the temperature with the number two reactor largely remained below 100 degrees Celsius, bringing the mercury below the 100 degree mark at all three troubled reactors. But TEPCO still faces challenges, such as stabilizing the cooling systems before a state of cold shutdown can be achieved. 100 degrees is a benchmark temperature for a cold shutdown, which is a goal for step two of TEPCO's plan to contain the nuclear disaster. The government is aiming to achieve a cold shutdown by the end of this year. Under normal circumstances, a cold shutdown can be reached when reactors are halted safely and the water inside drops below 100 degrees. But since the Fukushima plant has suffered nuclear fuel meltdowns, the criteria are somewhat different. That's why a cold shutdown has been redefined as bringing the temperatures at the bottom of the crippled reactors to below 100 degrees. Another requirement is curbing the release of radioactive substances so that additional human exposure near the plan can be limited to one millisievert per year or less. We are satisfied that all three troubled reactors are below 100 degrees. It's very important to maintain this situation permanently. One of the hurdles to achieving the cold shutdown is the presence of contaminated water. Water must be continuously injected into the reactors to keep them cool. But this produces 550 tons of radioactive water each day, which must be decontaminated. An expert points out another major hurdle. One hundred degrees is only a benchmark point, and achieving this does not mean the reactors are safe. Another major earthquake and tsunami could strike, and the water cooling systems could suddenly stop working. If this happens, it's vital that the cooling process is resumed quickly before additional melting occurs. 